Chapter 2 Desire, the Starting Point of All Achievement The First Step Toward Riches When Edwin C. Barnes climbed down in Orange, New Jersey, more than 30 years ago, he may have resembled a tramp, but his thoughts were those of a king. As he made his way from the railroad tracks to Thomas A. Edison's office, his mind was at work. He saw himself standing in Edison's presence. He heard himself asking Mr. Edison for an opportunity to carry out that one consuming obsession of his life, a burning desire to become the business associate of the great inventor. Barnes' desire was not a hope. It was not a wish. It was a keen, pulsating desire which transcended everything else. It was definite. The desire was not new when he approached Edison. It had been Barnes' dominating desire for a long time. In the beginning, when the desire first appeared in his mind, it may have been, or probably was, only a wish. But it was no mere wish when he appeared before Edison with it. A few years later, Edwin C. Barnes again stood before Edison in the same office where he first met the inventor. This time his desire had been translated into a reality. He was in business with Edison. The dominating dream of his life had become a reality. Today, people who know Barnes envy him because of the break life yielded him. They see him in the days of his triumph without taking the trouble to investigate the cause of his success. Barnes succeeded because he chose a definite goal, placed all his energy, all his willpower, all his effort, everything back of that goal. He did not become the partner of Edison the day he arrived. He was content to start in the most menial work, as long as it provided an opportunity to take even one step towards his cherished goal. Five years passed before the chance he had been seeking made its appearance. During all those years, not one ray of hope, not one promise of attainment of his desire had been held out to him. To everyone except himself, he appeared just another cog in the Edison business wheel. But in his own mind, he was the partner of Edison every minute of that time. From the very day he first went to work there. It is a remarkable illustration of the power of a definite desire. Barnes won his goal because he wanted to be a business associate of Mr. Edison more than he wanted anything else. He created a plan by which to attain that purpose, but he burned all bridges behind him. He stood by his desire until it became the dominating obsession of his life and finally a fact. When he went to Orange, he did not say to himself, I'll try to induce Edison to give me a job of some sort. He said, no, I will see Edison and put him on notice that I have come to do business with him. He did not say, oh, I'll work for a few months, and then if I get no encouragement, I'll just quit and go get a job somewhere else. He did say, no, I will start anywhere. I will do anything Edison tells me to do, but before I'm through, I will be his associate. He did not say, I will keep my eyes open for another opportunity in case I fail to get what I want in the Edison organization. No, he said, there is but one thing in this world that I am determined to have, and that is a business association with Thomas Edison. I will burn all bridges behind me and stake my entire future on my ability to get what I want. He left himself no possible way of retreat. He had to win or perish. This is all there is to the Barnes story of success. A long while ago, a great warrior faced a situation which made it necessary for him to make a decision which ensured his success on the battlefield. He was about to send his armies against a powerful foe whose men outnumbered his own. He loaded his soldiers into boats, sailed to the enemy's country, unloaded soldiers and equipment, then gave the order to burn the ships that had carried them. Dressing his men before the first battle, he said, You see the boats going up in smoke. That means that we cannot leave these shores alive unless we win. We now have no choice. We win or we perish. They won. Every person who wins in an undertaking must be willing to burn his ships and cut all sources of retreat. Only by doing so can one be sure of maintaining that state of mind known as a burning desire to win, which is essential to success. The morning after the Great Chicago Fire, a group of merchants stood on State Street, looking at the smoking remains of what had been their stores. They went into a conference to decide what if they could rebuild or leave Chicago and start over in a more promising section of the country. They reached a decision, all except one, to leave Chicago. The merchant who decided to stay and rebuild pointed a finger at the remains of his store and said, Gentlemen, on that very spot, I'm going to build the world's greatest store, no matter how many times it may burn down. This was more than 50 years ago. The store was built. 
It stands there today, a towering monument to the power of that state of mind known as a burning desire. The easy thing for Marshall Field to have done would have been exactly what his fellow merchants did. When the going was hard and the future looked dismal, they pulled up and went where the going seemed easier. Mark well this difference between Marshall Field and the other merchants, because it is the same difference which distinguishes Edwin C. Barnes from thousands of other young men who have worked in the Edison organization. It is the same difference which distinguishes practically all who succeed from those who fail. Every human being who reaches the age of understanding of the purpose of money wishes for it. Wishing will not bring riches, but desiring riches with a state of mind that becomes an obsession, then planning definite ways and means to acquire riches, and backing those plans with persistence, which is not recognized failure, will bring riches. The method by which desire for riches can be transmuted into its financial equivalent consists of six definite practical steps. These first. Fix in your mind the exact amount of money you desire. It is not sufficient merely to say, I want plenty of money. First, be definite as to the amount. There is a psychological reason for definiteness, which will be described in a subsequent chapter. Second, determine exactly what you intend to give in return for the money you desire. There is no such reality as something for nothing. Third, establish a definite date when you intend to possess the money you desire. Fourth, create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once, whether you are ready or not, to put this plan into action. Fifth, write out a clear, concise statement of the amount of money you intend to acquire. Name the time limit for its acquisition, state what you intend to give in return for the money, and describe clearly the plan through which you intend to accumulate it. Sixth, read your written statement aloud twice daily once just before retiring at night, and once after arising in the morning. As you read, see and feel and believe yourself already in possession of the money. It is important that you follow the instructions described in these six steps. It is especially important that you observe and follow the instructions in the sixth paragraph. You may complain that it is impossible for you to see yourself in possession of money before you actually have it. Here is where a burning desire will come to your aid. If you truly desire money so keenly that your desire is an obsession, you will have no difficulty in convincing yourself that you will acquire it. The object is to want money and to become so determined to have it that you convince yourself you will have it. Only those who become money conscious ever accumulate great riches. Money consciousness means that the mind has become so thoroughly saturated with the desire for money that one can see one's self already in possession of it. To the uninitiated, who has not been schooled on the working principles of the human mind, these instructions may appear impractical. It may be helpful to all who fail to recognize the soundness of the six steps to know that the information they convey was received from Andrew Carnegie, who began as an ordinary laborer in the steel mills, but managed, despite his humble beginning, to make these principles yield him a fortune of considerably more than $100 million. It may be of further help to know that the six steps here recommended were carefully scrutinized by the late Thomas Edison, who placed his stamp of approval upon them as being not only the steps essential for the accumulation of money, but necessary for the attainment of any definite goal. The steps call for no hard labor. They call for no sacrifice. They do not require one to become ridiculous or credulous. To apply them calls for no great amount of education. But the successful application of these six steps does call for sufficient imagination to enable one to see and to understand that accumulation of money cannot be left to chance, good fortune, and luck. One must realize that all who have accumulated great fortunes first did a certain amount of dreaming, hoping, wishing, desiring, and planning before they acquired money. You may as well know right here that you can never have riches in great quantities unless you can work yourself into a white heat of desire. For money, and actually believe you will possess it. You may as well know also that every great leader from the dawn of civilization down to the present was a dreamer. Christianity is the greatest potential power in the world today because its founder was an intense dreamer who had the vision and the imagination to see realities in their mental and spiritual form before they had been transmuted into physical form. If you do not see great riches in your imagination, you will never see them in your bank balance. Never in the history of America has there been so great an opportunity for practical dreamers as now exists. The six-year economic collapse has reduced all men, substantially, to the same level. A new race is about to be run. 
The stakes represent huge fortunes which will be accumulated within the next 10 years. The rules of the race have changed because we now live in a changed world, and that definitely favors the masses. Those who had but little or no opportunity to win under the conditions existing during the Depression, when fear paralyzed growth and development. We who are in this race for riches should be encouraged to know that this changed world in which we live is demanding new ideas, new ways of doing things, new leaders, new inventions, new methods of teaching, new methods of marketing, new books, new literature, new features for the radio, new ideas for moving pictures. Back of all this demand for new and better things, there is one quality which one must possess to win, and that is definiteness of purpose the knowledge of what one wants, and a burning desire to possess it. The business depression marks the death of one age and the birth of another. This changed world requires practical dreamers who can and will put their dreams into action. The practical dreamers have always been and always will be the pattern makers of civilization. We who desire to accumulate riches should remember the real leaders of the world always have been men who harnessed and put into practical use the intangible, unseen forces of unborn opportunity, and have converted those forces, or impulses of thought, into skyscrapers, cities, factories, airplanes, automobiles, and every form of convenience that makes life more pleasant. Tolerance and an open mind are practical necessities of the dreamer of today. Those who are afraid of new ideas are doomed before they start. Never has there been a time more favorable to pioneers than the present. True, there is no wild and woolly west to be conquered, as in the days of covered wagon. But there is a vast business, financial and industrial world to be remolded and redirected along new and better lines. In planning to acquire your share of the riches, let no one influence you to scorn the dreamer. To win the big stakes in this changed world, you must catch the spirit of the great pioneers of the past whose dreams have given to civilization all that it has of value, the spirit which serves as the lifeblood of your own country, your opportunities, and mine, to develop and market our talents. Let us not forget, Columbus dreamed of an unknown world, staked his life on the existence of such a world, and discovered it. Copernicus, the great astronomer, dreamed of a multiplicity of worlds and revealed them. No one denounced him as impractical after he had triumphed, Instead, the world worshipped at his shrine, thus proving once more that success requires no apologies. Failure permits no alibis. If the thing you wish to do is right, go ahead and do it. Put your dream across and never mind what they say if you meet with temporary defeat, or they perhaps do not know that every failure brings with it the seeds of an equivalent success. Henry Ford, poor and uneducated, dreamed of a horseless carriage, went to work with what tools he possessed, without waiting for opportunity to favor him, and now evidence of his dream belts the entire earth. He has put more wheels into operation than any man who ever lived, because he was not afraid to back his dreams. Thomas Edison dreamed of a lamp that could be operated by electricity, began where he stood to put his dream into action. Despite more than 10,000 failures, he stood by that dream until he made it a physical reality. Practical dreamers do not quit. Whelan dreamed of a chain of cigar stores, transformed his dream into action, and now the United Cigar Stores occupy the best corners in America. Lincoln dreamed of freedom for the black slaves, put his dream into action, and barely missed living to see a united North and South translate his dream into reality. The Wright brothers dreamed of a machine that would fly through the air. Now one may see evidence all over the world that they dreamed soundly. Marconi dreamed of a system for harnessing the intangible forces of the ether, Evidence that he did not dream in vain may be found in every wireless and radio in the world. Moreover, Marconi's dream brought the humblest cabin and the most stately manor house side by side. It made the people of every nation on earth backdoor neighbors. It gave the President of the United States a medium by which he may talk to all the people of America at one time and on short notice. It may interest you to know that Marconi's friends had him taken into custody and examined in a psychopathic hospital when he announced he had discovered a principle through which he could send messages through the air without the aid of wires or other direct physical means of communication. The dreamers of today fare better. The world has become accustomed to new discoveries. Nay, it has shown a willingness to reward the dreamer who gives the world a new idea. Quote, the greatest achievement was at first, and for a time, but a dream. 
The oak sleeps in the acorn. The bird waits in the egg. And in the highest vision of the soul, a waking angel stirs. Dreams are the seedlings of reality. Awake, arise, and assert yourself, you dreamers of the world. Your star is now in the ascendancy. The world of the depression brought the opportunity you have been waiting for. It taught people humility, tolerance, and open-mindedness. The world is filled with an abundance of opportunity which the dreamers of the past never knew. A burning desire to be and to do is the starting point from which the dreamer must take off. Dreams are not born of indifference, laziness, or lack of ambition. The world no longer scoffs at the dreamer, nor calls him impractical. If you think it does, take a trip to Tennessee and witness what a dreamer president has done in the way of harnessing and using the great water power of America. A score of years ago, such a dream would have seemed like madness. You have been disappointed. You have undergone defeat during the Depression. You have felt the great heart within you crushed until it bled. Take courage, for these experiences have tempered the spiritual metal of which you are made. They are assets of incomparable value. Remember, too, that all who succeed in life get off to a bad start and pass through many heartbreaking struggles before they, quote-unquote, arrive. The turning point in the lives of those who succeed usually comes at a moment of some crisis, through which they are introduced to their other selves. John Bunyan wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, which is among the finest of all English literature, after he had been confined in prison and sorely punished because of his views on the subject of religion. O. Henry discovered the genius which slept within his brain after he had met with great misfortune and was confined in a prison cell in Columbus, Ohio, forced through misfortune to become acquainted with his other self and to use his imagination, he discovered himself to be a great author instead of a miserable criminal and outcast. Strange and varied are the ways of life, and stranger still are the ways of infinite intelligence, through which men are sometimes forced to undergo all sorts of punishment before discovering their own brains and their own capacity to create useful ideas through imagination. Edison, the world's greatest inventor and scientist, was a quote-unquote tramp telegraph operator. He failed innumerable times before he was driven finally to the discovery of the genius which slept within his brain. Charles Dickens began by pasting labels on blacking pots. The tragedy of his first love penetrated the depths of his soul and converted him into one of the world's truly great authors. That tragedy produced first David Copperfield, then a succession of other works that made this a richer and better world for all who read his books. Disappointment over love affairs generally has the effect of driving men to drink, and women to ruin, and this because most people never learn the art of transmuting their strongest emotions into dreams of a constructive nature. Helen Keller became deaf, dumb, and blind shortly after birth. Despite her greatest misfortune, she has written her name indelibly in the pages of the history of the great. Her entire life has served as evidence that no one ever is defeated until defeat has been accepted as a reality. Robert Burns was an illiterate country lad. He was cursed by poverty and grew up to be a drunkard in the bargain. The world was made better for his having lived because he clothed beautiful thoughts in poetry and thereby plucked a thorn and planted a rose in its place. Booker T. Washington was born into slavery, handicapped by race and color, because he was tolerant, had an open mind at all times on all subjects, and was a dreamer. He left his impress for good on an entire race. Beethoven was deaf. Milton was blind, but their names will last as long as time endures because they dreamed and translated their dreams into organized thought. Before passing to the next chapter, kindle anew in your mind the fire of hope, faith, courage, and tolerance. If you have these states of mind and a working knowledge of the principles described, all else you need will come to you when you're ready for it. Let Emerson state the thought in these words. Every proverb Every book, every byword that belongs to thee for aid and comfort shall surely come through open or winding passages. Every friend whom not thy fantastic will, but the great and tender soul in thee craveth, shall lock thee in his embrace. There is no difference between wishing for a thing and being ready to receive it. No one is ready for a thing until he believes he can acquire it. The state of mind must be belief, not mere hope or wish. Open-mindedness is essential for belief. Closed minds do not inspire faith, courage, and belief. Remember, no more effort is required to aim high in life, to demand abundance and prosperity, than is required to accept misery and poverty. 
A great poet has correctly stated this universal truth through these lines. I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more. However, I begged at evening, when I counted my scanty store. For life is a just employer, he gives you what you ask. But once you have set the wages, why you must bear the task. I worked for a menial's hire, only to learn dismayed, that any wage I had hoped of life, life would have willingly paid. Desire outwits Mother Nature As a fitting climax to this chapter, I wish to introduce one of the most unusual persons I have ever known. I first saw him 24 years ago, a few minutes after he was born. He came into the world without any physical sign of ears, and the doctor admitted when pressed for an opinion that the child might be deaf and mute for life. I challenged the doctor's opinion. I had the right to do so. I was the child's father. I, too, reached a decision and rendered an opinion, but I expressed the opinion silently in the secrecy of my own heart. I decided that my son would hear and speak. Nature could send me a child without ears, but nature could not induce me to accept the reality of the affliction. In my own mind, I knew that my son would hear and speak. How? I was sure there must be a way, and I knew I would find it. I thought of the words of the immortal Emerson. The whole course of things goes to teach us faith. We need only obey. There is guidance for each of us, and by lowly listening, we shall hear the right word. The right word? Desire. More than anything else, I desired that my son should not be deaf-mute. From that desire I never receded, not for a second. Many years previously I had written, Our only limitations are those we set up in our own minds. For the first time I wondered if that statement were true. Lying on the bed in front of me was a newly born child without the natural equipment of hearing. Even though he might hear and speak, he was obviously disfigured for life. Surely, this was a limitation which that child had not set up in his own mind. What could I do about it? Somehow I would find a way to transplant into that child's mind my own burning desire for ways and means of conveying sound to his brain without the aid of ears. As soon as the child was old enough to cooperate, I would fill his mind so completely with the burning desire to hear that nature would, by methods of her own, translate it into physical reality. All this thinking took place in my own mind, but I spoke of it to no one. Every day I renewed the pledge I had made to myself not to accept a deaf mute for a son. As he grew older, he began to take notice of things around him. We observed that he had a slight degree of hearing. When he reached the age when children usually begin talking, he made no attempt to speak, but we could tell by his actions that he could hear certain sounds slightly. That was all I wanted to know. I was convinced that if he could hear, even slightly, he might develop still greater hearing capacity. Then something happened that gave me hope, and it came from an entirely unexpected source. We bought a Victrola. When the child heard the music for the first time, he went into ecstasies and promptly appropriated the machine. He soon showed a preference for certain records. Among them, it's a long way to Tipperary. On one occasion, he played that piece over and over for almost two hours, standing in front of the Victrola with his teeth clamped on the edge of the case. The significance of the self-formed habit of his did not become clear to us until years afterward, for we had never heard of the principle of bone conduction of sound at the time. Shortly after he appropriated the Victrola, I discovered that he could hear me quite clearly when I spoke with my lips touching his mastoid bone, or at the base of the brain. These discoveries placed in my possession the necessary media by which I began to translate into reality my burning desire to help my son develop hearing and speech. By that time he was making stabs at speaking certain words. The outlook was far from encouraging, but desire, backed by faith, knows no such word as impossible. Having determined that he could hear the sound of my voice plainly, I began immediately to transfer to his mind the desire to speak and hear. I soon discovered that the child enjoyed bedtime stories, so I went to work creating stories designed to develop in him self-reliance, imagination, and a keen desire to hear and to be normal. There was one story in particular which I emphasized by giving it some new and dramatic coloring each time it was told. It was designed to plant in his mind the thought that his affliction was not a liability, but an asset of great value. Despite the fact that all the philosophy I had examined clearly indicated that every adversity brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage, I must confess that I had not the slightest idea how this affliction could ever become an asset. However, I continued my practice of wrapping that philosophy in bedtime stories, hoping the time would come when he would find some plan by which his handicap could be made to serve some useful purpose. 
Reason told me plainly that there was no adequate compensation for the lack of ears and natural hearing equipment. Desire, backed by faith, pushed reason aside and inspired me to carry on. As I analyze the experience in retrospect, I can see now that my son's faith in me had much to do with the astounding results. He did not question anything I told him. I sold him the idea that he had a distinct advantage over his older brother and that his advantage would reflect itself in many ways. For example, the teachers in school would observe that he had no ears, and because of this, they would show him special attention and treat him with extraordinary kindness. They always did. His mother saw to that by visiting the teachers and arranging with them to give the child the extra attention necessary. I sold him the idea, too, that when he became old enough to sell newspapers, his older brother had already become a newspaper merchant, he would have a big advantage over his brother for the reason that people would pay him extra money for his wares because they could see that he was a bright, industrious boy, despite the fact that he had no ears. We could notice that, gradually, the child's hearing was improving. Moreover, he had not the slightest tendency to become self-conscious because of his affliction. When he was about seven, he showed the first evidence that our method of servicing his mind was bearing fruit. For several months, he begged for the privilege of selling newspapers, but his mother would not give her consent. She was afraid that his deafness might make it unsafe for him to go on the street alone. Finally, he took matters into his own hands. One afternoon, when he was left at home with the servants, he climbed through the kitchen window, shinnied down to the ground, and set out on his own. He borrowed six cents in capital from the neighborhood shoemaker, invested it in papers, sold out, reinvested, and kept repeating until late in the evening. After balancing his accounts and paying back the six cents he was borrowed from his banker, he had a net profit of 42 cents. When he got home that night, we found him in bed asleep with the money tightly clenched in his hand. His mother opened his hand, removed the coins, and cried. Of all things, crying over her son's first victory seemed so inappropriate. My reaction was the reverse. I laughed heartily, for I knew that my endeavor to plant in the child's mind an attitude of faith in himself had been successful. His mother saw in his first business venture a little deaf boy who had gone out in the streets and risked his life to earn money. I saw a brave, ambitious, self-reliant little businessman whose stock in himself had been increased a 100% because he had gone into business on his own initiative and had won. The transaction pleased me because I knew he had given evidence of a trait of resourcefulness that would go with him through life. Later events proved this to be a virtue. When his older brother wanted something, he would lie down on the floor, kick his feet in the air, cry for it, and get it. When the little deaf boy wanted something, he would plan a way to earn the money, then buy it for himself. He still follows that plan. Truly, my son has taught me that handicaps can be converted into stepping stones on which one may climb towards some worthy goal unless they are accepted as obstacles and used as alibis. The little deaf boy went through the grades, high school, and college without being able to hear his teachers, excepting when they shouted loudly at close range. He did not go to a school for the deaf. We would not permit him to learn the sign language. We were determined that he would live a normal life and associate with normal children, and we stood by that decision, although it cost us many heated debates with school officials. While he was in high school, he tried an electric hearing aid, but it was of no value to him, due, we believed, to a condition that was disclosed when the child was six by Dr. J. Gordon Wilson of Chicago, when he operated on one side of the boy's head and discovered that there was no sign of natural hearing equipment. During his last week in college, 18 years after the operation, something happened which marked the most important turning point in his life. Through what seemed to be mere chance, he came into possession of another electrical hearing device, which was sent to him on a trial. He was slow about testing it, due to his disappointment with a similar device. Finally, he picked the instrument up, and more or less carelessly, placed it on his head, hooked up the small battery, and lo, as if by a stroke of magic, his lifelong desire for normal hearing became a reality. For the first time in his life, he heard practically as well as any person with normal hearing. God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Overjoyed because of the changed world which had been brought to him through this hearing device, he rushed to the telephone, called his mother, and heard her voice perfectly. The next day, he plainly heard the voices of his professors in class for the first time in his life. Previously, he could hear them only when they shouted at short range. He heard the radio. He heard the talking pictures. For the first time in his life, he could converse freely with other people without the necessity of their having to speak loudly. Truly, he had come into possession of a changed world. We had refused to accept nature's error, and by persistent desire, we had induced nature to correct that error through the only practical means available. 
Desire had commenced to pay dividends, but the victory was not yet complete. The boy still had to find a definite and practical way to convert his handicap into an equivalent asset. Hardly realizing the significance of what had already been accomplished, but intoxicated with the joy of his newly discovered world of sound, he wrote a letter to the manufacturer of the hearing aid, enthusiastically describing his experience. Something in his letter, something perhaps which was not written on the lines, but back of them, caused the company to invite him to New York. When he arrived, he was escorted through the factory, and while talking with the chief engineer, telling him about his changed world, a hunch, an idea, or an inspiration, call it what you wish, flashed into his mind. It was this impulse of thought which converted his affliction into an asset, destined to pay dividends in both money and happiness to thousands for all time to come. The sum and substance of that impulse of thought was this. It occurred to him that he might be able to help the millions of deafened people who go through life without the benefit of hearing devices if he could find a way to tell them the story of this changed world. Then and there, he reached a decision to devote the remainder of his life to rendering useful service to the hard of hearing. For an entire month, he carried on an intensive research, during which he analyzed the entire marketing systems of the manufacturer of the hearing device and created ways and means of communicating with the hard of hearing all over the world for the purpose of sharing with them his newly discovered, changed world. When this was done, he put in writing a two-year plan, based upon his findings. When he presented the plan to the company, he was instantly given a position for the purpose of carrying out his ambition. Little did he dream, when he went to work, that he was destined to bring hope and practical relief to thousands of deafened people who, without his help, would have been doomed forever to deaf mutism. Shortly after he became associated with the manufacturer of his hearing aid, he invited me to attend a class conducted by his company for the purpose of teaching deaf mutes to hear and to speak. I had never heard of such a form of education before I visited the class, skeptical but hopeful at my time would not be entirely wasted. Here I saw a demonstration which gave me greatly enlarged vision of what I had done to arouse and keep alive in my son's mind the desire for normal hearing. I saw deaf mutes actually being taught to hear and to speak through application of the self-same principle I had used more than 20 years previously in saving my son from deaf mutism. Thus, through some strange turn of the wheel of fate, my son Blair and I have been destined to aid in correcting deaf mutism for those yet unborn, because we are the only living human beings, as far as I know, who have established definitely the fact that deaf mutism can be corrected to the extent of restoring to normal life those who suffer with this affliction. It has been done for one, it'll be done for others. There is no doubt in my mind that Blair would have been a deaf mute all his life if his mother and I had not managed to shape his mind as we did. The doctor who attended at his birth told us confidentially the child might never hear or speak. A few weeks ago, Dr. Irving Voorhees, a noted specialist on such cases, examined Blair very thoroughly. He was astounded when he learned how well my son now hears and speaks and said his examination indicated that theoretically the boy should not be able to hear at all. But the lad does hear, despite the fact that x-ray pictures show there is no opening in the skull whatsoever from where his ears should be to the brain. When I planted in his mind the desire to hear and talk and live as a normal person, there went with the impulse some strange influence which caused nature to become a bridge builder and span the gulf of silence between his brain and the outer world by some means which the keenest medical specialists have not been able to interpret. It would be sacrilege for me to even conjecture as to how nature performed this miracle. It would be unforgivable if I neglected to tell the world as much as I know of the humble part I assumed in the strange experience. It is my duty and a privilege to say I believe, and not without reason, that nothing is impossible to the person who backs desire with enduring faith. Barely, a burning desire has devious ways of transmuting itself into its physical equivalent. Blair desired normal hearing. Now he has it. He was born with a handicap which might easily have sent one with less defined desire to a street with a bundle of pencils and a tin cup. That handicap now promises to serve as the medium by which he will render useful service to many millions of hard of hearing, also to give him useful employment at adequate financial compensation for the remainder of his life. The little white lies I planted in his mind when he was a child by leading him to believe his affliction would become a great asset, which he could capitalize, has justified itself. Verily, there is nothing, right or wrong, which belief, plus burning desire, cannot make real. These qualities are free to everyone, 
In all my experience in dealing with men and women who had personal problems, I never handled a single case which more definitely demonstrates the power of desire. Authors sometimes make the mistake of writing of subjects of which they have not but superficial or very elementary knowledge. It has been my good fortune to have had the privilege of testing the soundness of the power of desire through the affliction of my own son. Perhaps it was providential that the experience came as it did, for surely no one is better prepared than he to serve as an example of what happens when desire is put to the test. If Mother Nature bends to the will of desire, is it logical that mere men can defeat a burning desire? Strange and imponderable is the power of the human mind. We do not understand the method for which it uses every circumstances, every individual, every physical thing within its reach as a mean of transmuting desire into its physical counterpart. Perhaps science will uncover this secret. I planted in my son's mind the desire to hear and to speak as any normal person hears and speaks. That desire has now become a reality. I planted in his mind the desire to convert his greatest handicap into his greatest asset. That desire has been realized. The modus operandi by which the astounding result was achieved is not hard to describe. It consisted of three very definite facts. First, I mixed faith with the desire for normal hearing, which I passed on to my son. Second, I communicated my desire to him in every conceivable way available, through persistent, continuous effort over a period of years. Third, he believed me. As this chapter was being completed, news came of the death of Madame Schumannheink. One short paragraph of the news dispatch gives the clue to this unusual woman's stupendous success as a singer. I quote the paragraph because the clue it contains is none other than desire. Early in her career, Madame Schumann Heink visited the director of the Vienna Court Opera to have him test her voice. But he did not test it. After taking one look at the awkward and poorly dressed girl, he exclaimed, None too gently. With such a face, and with no personality at all, how can you ever expect to succeed in opera? My good child, give up the idea. Buy a sewing machine and go to work. You can never be a singer. Never is a long time. The director of the Vienna Court Opera knew much about the technique of singing. He knew little about the power of desire when it assumes the proportion of an obsession. If he had known more of that power, he would have not made the mistake of condemning genius without giving it an opportunity. Several years ago, one of my business associates became ill. He became worse as time went on and finally was taken to the hospital for an operation. Just before he was wheeled into the operating room, I took a look at him and wondered how anyone as thin and emaciated as he could possibly go through a major operation successfully. The doctor warned me that there was little of any chance of me ever seeing him alive again. But that was the doctor's opinion. It was not the opinion of the patient. Just before he was wheeled away, he whispered feebly, Don't be disturbed, chief. I'll be out of here in a few days. The attending nurse looked at me with pity, but the patient did come through safely. After it was all over, his physician said, Nothing but his own desire to live saved him. He would never have pulled through if he had not refused to accept the possibility of death. I believe in the power of desire, backed by faith, because I have seen this power lift men from lowly beginnings to places of power and wealth. I have seen it rob the grave of its victims. I have seen it serve as the medium by which men stage a comeback after having been defeated in a hundred different ways. I have seen it provide my own son with a normal, happy, successful life, despite nature's having sent him into a world without ears. How can one harness and use the power of desire? This has been answered through this and the subsequent chapters of this book. This message is going out to the world at the end of the longest and perhaps the most devastating depression America has ever known. It is reasonable to presume that the message may come to the attention of many who have been wounded by the depression, those who have lost their fortunes, others who have lost their positions, and great numbers who must recognize their plans and stage a comeback. To all these, I wish to convey the thought that all achievement, no matter what may be its nature or its purpose, must begin with an intense, burning desire for something definite. Through some strange and powerful principle of mental chemistry, which she has never divulged, nature wraps up in the impulse of strong desire that something, quote-unquote, which recognizes no such word as impossible and accepts no such reality. Is failure. 